like you said, those were a few words, but you packed it up in half punch in those few words. Um, may I now invite Dr. Sam Petroda, advisor to the Prime Minister of uh, India on Public Information Stru Infrastructure and Innovation. Justice Ganguly, <coughs> Dinesh Bhai Trivedi, <coughs> Michelle Bhai, dignitaries on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. <coughs> It is indeed a privilege to be here with Nishit Bhai, whom I have known for over 35 years. He has been part of our family, and it is good to be with him at this great event. I want to wish you the best. I hope that the Delhi office grows as well as Bombay office and Bangalore office has grown and Silicon Valley office. I'm a little bit uncomfortable talking about greed and good. I'm used to talking about technology, science, telecom. But sitting there, I thought I got to say something that makes sense, at least to me. So I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts on greed to good. Greed has been around for a long, long time. And I can assure you, it's going to be around for even longer. So don't expect greed to go away. Greed, violence, envy, jealousy is part of the human behavior. Alexander the Great was greedy. Changiz Khan was greedy. Kings were greedy. They were looking for power, control. <coughs> British Raj was greedy. Some of the business people are greedy. And greed has been all over. But earlier, for 15,000 years, greed was basically concentrated. Very few people were greedy, and rest of the people were poor. All of a sudden, that changed in 1712. In 1712, steam engine was invented. Now you could take water out and generate coal and energy and found gas and oil, and all of a sudden, we found huge amount of wealth underground that you could harness and create new power. And that sort of created a whole new business, industrial revolution. And greed started spreading. Now, what King had, some of the business people could have. And I see this as part of the process of democratization of greed. Then comes large number of new inventions, factories, manufacturing and industrial age, which created very wealthy new nations. Take for example US where you have 250 million who have 50% of world resources. That was a greed of a different type. All of a sudden, in the last 20 years, things changed. Because now you got about 3 billion more into the mainstream. 1 billion from India, 1 from China, 1 roughly from former Soviet Union. And you got 300, uh, 3 billion more, along with 300 million from US, looking for the same kind of prosperity. Everyone wants to copy U.S. because U.S. model based on consumption is something everybody wants, which is not scalable, desirable, sustainable, or workable. In parallel, information and communication technology really created openness, access, connectivity, and knowledge spread 
and local events become international instantly. So all of a sudden, greed is exposed in a big way. Something happening in Chicago becomes a piece of conversation in Delhi within two minutes. So now, in this environment, greed finds a lot of discussion. <coughs> when people are creating wealth, the idea of Wild Wild West in the US, you find lots and lots of rich who find ways and means of creating wealth which are not acceptable to many. But these things go on. And even business schools today teach you a lot more about value extraction than value creation. There's a big difference. There is very little being taught on value creation. It is all about value extraction, which is another kind of a greed. With all of this, all of a sudden, you see in US, mortgage crisis, Madoff, failures of banks, crisis in Europe, 2G scam here. All kinds of scams all of a sudden become public. <coughs> Media is really enjoying these kinds of events. And as a result, again, grid becomes a very common topic of discussions everywhere. Just because all of this is happening, don't expect it to go away. I don't think regulation would answer a lot of these questions. When people talk about Lokpal Bill, somebody asked me a question, I said, look, I don't expect that to solve problems. It helps. The problem really lies within. Once at a press conference, somebody asked me a question saying, what do you think of corruption? I said, look, only thing I can tell you is I'm not corrupt. Guarantee. 100%. But I can't tell you that about my family, my wife, my children, my uncle. I just don't know. If enough of us looked at that way, I think greed would have a different meaning. IT is a good start on one hand to democratize greed, on the other hand to really spread information awareness. So when RTI, Right to Information, bill was passed, I believe that was a good beginning in India of opening up the systems. The question is, you have RTI but you don't have information. How do you organize information in new formats for public to access? And that's where people like us come in. <laughs> Saying, how do you create public information infrastructure? to really provide instant information about everything, to create open society. It's going to take probably 50 years, but it's going to happen. WikiLeaks was a classical example. WikiLeaks became a problem because public perception as to what was right versus private, what was right was very different. If what you say and what you do match, you don't have problems with WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks became a big sensational item because what you said in public was very different from what you said in private. To me, greed is one piece of the puzzle. How do you go from greed to good? What is good? What do you consider good? Do you go make billions of dollars and then say, I'm going to convert that into philanthropy? Is that good? Or while making billions of dollars, you do good? General impression today is you make lots of money and then you begin to donate. How you made, then nobody is going to question. I think these are very complex issues. I don't think there are good answers to all of this. We would be naive if we think by talking about lawyers, accountants, laws, government, governance, we're going to get rid of greed. It just doesn't happen that way. But I do believe that the answer lies in Gandhian way of looking at things. 
simplicity, modest living, concern for the poor, love for all, respect for others, truth and absolute truth, <coughs> trust. These are very critical to good as well as to greed. Again, we know all the answers to practice these things. It's easy to say, you do it. I won't do it. I think the only way to say, I don't care about whether you do it or not, I got to do it. If I'm the only person who's going to do it, too bad. If enough of us begin to think that way, I believe we may be able to make a dent. The U.S. model based on consumption worries me. It worries me because everybody wants to copy. India is copying it. China is copying it. Everybody thinks of Wall Street. Everybody thinks of taking public company public. Everybody wants bigger IRR, more growth, more growth. And that is not sustainable. We need new model of development. We don't know what that is. And I think these are the questions we need to really look at going forward. I tell my friends in U.S. that in spite of best of the best education in U.S., over 2% of the people in U.S. are in prison. Because we have paid a lot of attention to Six Sigma quality of product, but not Six Sigma quality of people. How do you create Six Sigma quality people? Our education systems are not designed to do that. I think mean, these are bigger questions than little regulation here, little governance issue there. Always nice to talk about it. But we need to look at far beyond tinkering with the system. And that far beyond is within each one of us. I worry about these things because I don't see people talking about searching inside. It is always about looking outside. I hope that today's discussion would help some of us. Once again, I want to wish all the best for Nishit Desai and Associates and want to thank you for giving us this opportunity and it's good to be here. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Petroda. We've uh, all learned from you important principles of creating value and inclusive growth. And I think today you've given us thoughts about creating new models of development um, um, with introspection. Um, can I now uh, invite Mr. Shadna Tukral to open the panel discussion and uh, moderate the discussion? Thanks so much, uh, Pratibha, for inviting me, and thank you, Nishit Bhai, for inviting me to host this panel discussion. I'm told uh, on the panel we have uh, three eminent guests who will take part in the active panel discussion, and then we will open it up to the audience. Uh, those who will take part are <coughs> Nishit Bhai, Mr. Krishnan, and Parag. So I think we'll just do uh, some interchanging of seats so that they're all together. You want to sit in the middle? Thanks so much, everyone. My name is Shivnath, and I want to congratulate Mr. Bai for the inauguration of your office. And I must tell you, before I came in here, I got the ground rules uh, set by Mr. Bai. So some of these are guided by him. The intention of this panel discussion is not to just pay lip service. 
Uh, when we talk of governance in this country, then we talk about ethics and values, and trust me, over my last 15 years of uh, previous professional journeys, I've heard many discussions which talk a lot, but nobody comes up with real solutions. So when I was talking to Nishad Bhai, he said, look, I need start pe people to start thinking. There have to be uh, some provocations. People have to give ideas, come up with solutions, and I believe he already has some suggestions coming in on email as to how we will uh, proceed with that. But before I uh, kick off and I introduce my panel, just one thing, I read the topic, and Nishad Bhai, if I may take the liberty, uh, you talk about transformation uh, from greed to good as if greed and good are in opposite camps. I think Nishad Bhai said it very nicely, greed is like cholesterol, it can be good or bad. So the question I would flip around and put is, can greed be good? And then we, if we talk about corporate governance, maybe uh, that would give us some insights as well. Uh, greed in some ways also reminds me of Darwin's uh, theory of survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. If people did not want to survive and did not want to do better than others, how would we all come about? Now if it happens that uh, pushing others away, then there is something wrong about it, which leads us to the question of ethics and values. Uh, we will uh, start off by opening remarks from Mr. K. Krishnan. Um, he's an advisor uh, to the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, uh, post which we'll have Parag give his opening comments and then Nishit and then we'll do an interaction and open it to the audience. Mr. Krishna. Thank you, Shivnath. Uh, good evening to all of you. Let me also join the others in uh, first congratulating Mr. Desai <coughs> on the <coughs> office in Delhi. And uh, what I gather is that this office will have a, a clear emphasis on some kind of uh, sort of interaction and contribution to public policy. That's, it's much needed. And uh, let me uh, also thank him for this opportunity. Uh, what I uh, will try and do is that in the sort of in, in less than 10 minutes, uh, it's not it's easy to move from slogans and, and sort of cliches to details. Uh, but like the devil, I think the angel is also in the details. Uh, I will try within the limitations of uh, time and, and my own capabilities to try and focus on some issues which I think are relevant in our current context. Uh, what I intend doing is to speak for a few minutes on some conceptual issues of uh, corporate governance and then move on to maybe three illustrations, two on legal aspects and one on the supporting uh, what Nishit Bhai called uh, the enabling environment or the ecosystem to reinforce the, the basic point. Now what is the conceptual sort of uh, underpinning of uh, corporate governance? It is essentially a mechanism to ensure that an organization and, and this is irrespective of whether we are talking about a company or a society or a, or a much larger macro body like a nation, an organization actually achieves the objectives that it has set for itself. So I want to emphasize this point because I think in a lot of our conversations, this is uh, sort of, we are losing sight of this because I believe that a lot of the associated elements is to primarily ensure this objective, namely the organization achieves the objectives for which it was set up in the first place. Now, given the fact, as uh, Honorable Justice Ganguly pointed out in his inaugural, there are multiple stakeholders in any organization. We are therefore necessarily talking about, uh, to use jargon, an optimization exercise, an optimization within constraints rather than a maximization exercise. Now, the constraints are the boundaries which, in the case of a company, the larger sort of uh, framework of public policy and the law will say, but clearly one is talking about optimization, not maximization. Even in the original conceptual literature on corporate governance, the emphasis is on optimization. Now, governance generally, and as a subset of governance, corporate governance is characterized by, again to use jargon, what are called positive externalities. It does a lot of good things for people other than the ones who are practicing and is therefore a classic public good. 
and elementary economics tells us that public goods are always underproduced because the benefits are beyond the person who is actually doing it and therefore there will be an underproduction and therefore there is a classic sort of role for state intervention to ensure the right level of production of this public good. So in my mind, the role for public policy to ensure corporate governance is in a sense self-evident. It is bound to sort of happen only when there is intervention because in the absence of an intervention, public goods will seldom be produced in the quantum that we require. Now having sort of uh, said this, my only concern is typically, and, and this point is with reference to India, we have gone about this primarily using the legal mechanism. Our entire approach to corporate governance is, I think, overly legal centric. Like very many other things in life, corporate governance is as much a product, and this is the point I think uh, 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 Nishit was making very effectively, as much a product of an enabling environment and a supportive ecosystem, an ecosystem which nurtures ethics, which nurtures good behavior, and which promotes strong adherence to these values. So if there is something lacking in this ecosystem, excessive reliance on law is unlikely to bring about the outcome that we are striving for. Now, with this sort of very basic conceptual uh, sort of two pennies worth on corporate governance primer, let me move to my illustrations. And the illustrations I have are, as I said, two from legal uh, aspects and one on the ecosystem. The first illustration I have is, a, is a, an illustration to bring out the point that well-intentioned, well-meaning provisions in the law often lead to very perverse outcomes. And here I'm going to use very nice, recent, good quality, uh, financial economics literature, but I'll use it in exactly two minutes and be within your time limit to make the point. Namely, India's corporate governance emphasizes increasing or imposing on the independent director a lot of liabilities. Potentially, the benefit is there will be greater vigilance and hence reduction of cases where the independent directors are found, quote unquote, sleeping at the wheel. Now, this potentially has a negative consequence. This will increase the costs as perceived by the independent directors. And now, recently, a brilliant paper written by two very high quality academics in the ISB, Krishnamurti Subramaniam and Rajesh Chakravarti, and a third person from BIT, uh, Pilani, a gentleman called Naresh Kotrike, actually takes the example of the Satyam episode in India. and the Nimesh Kampani episode in Andhra Pradesh takes data from filings, the comprehensive filings that companies do to the stock exchanges, looks into the director's database maintained by a, a lot of uh, database companies, and the findings are very interesting. And, and these are very robust economically, statistically, econometrically sound findings. And I will just quickly summarize the findings. The aggregate effects on corporate India as a result of whatever happened in these two episodes, impact one, clear and sort of noticeable shrinkage in the long run supply of independent directors. And there is a clear adverse effect on board quality. They have actually measured board quality by looking at the, they have details of educational qualifications of independent directors. And you can safely make a proxy that if you have a, a person trained in business, trained in law, a postgraduate or a doctorate, you can make some assumptions about their quality vis-a-vis -vis less qualified people. With some sort of, uh, uh, of these assumptions, they clearly find an adverse effect, a noticeable adverse effect on the quality of boards. And they find a 30% increase in the remuneration to independent directors. Now, is this what we actually intended? We, in law and in our objective, actually intended the precise opposite in terms of outcomes. But thanks to the way behavior shapes uh, outcomes, 
The final outcome in the Satyam case, I don't need to go into the facts of this uh, case. Likewise, the Nimesh Kampani episode, I don't need to go to uh, you know, this audience, the facts of this case. The actual outcomes measured robustly have been the opposite of what was intended by the law. Now, we need to keep in mind that we've also got, uh, I will take the liberty of mentioning this uh, in the presence of the Honorable Minister, the episode of seven directors, including the independent directors of a hospital, being arrested. Now, we need to keep in mind the fact that given a legal any trouble, so we are going to have precisely the opposite of what we intended. Quickly to move to a second illustration is to make the opposite point, namely a framework which is inadequate in its design and therefore produces suboptimal <coughs> outcomes. And the example I have is our very, le very weak sort of requirements for quote unquote calling a company publicly listed. A company is publicly listed with an, with an excessively low percentage of shares actually with the public. All kinds of funny definitions of promoters and who constitutes public. The net result is compared to any other decently well-governed country, we have very, very low requirements of listing of shares for the public. And this is a lacuna in the law as it's written, and it obviously produces outcomes that are suboptimal, and, and one can have a discussion on this as we go along. And the last uh, illustration I have to sort of uh, make the larger point about the enabling environment in the ecosystem is the way in which we have ensured the non-development of a strong domestic institutional investor sector. These are typically the kind of people who have the muscle, the research, the ability to actually keep corporates in check. And the largest of India's pension funds are kept out of the market and they'll be kept out of the markets for years to come for sort of wrong notions of uh, public good. And this enabling environment is one more contributory factor to a lot of what you see as corporate governance abuses and companies. Now, let me conclude by suggesting what is, in my opinion, the way forward. And here I am encouraged to see that Nishit Bhai, in a completely different context, in the context of the direct taxes code bill, had said exactly the sort of similar things. There is excellent quality empirical work done by India, Indian academics on details of what is actually going on in India. We need to fully understand this behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and need to write our laws based on this kind of expertise. Lawmaking is now an enormous amount of domain knowledge that we, we need to incorporate. And one good example that I see currently happening is in the financial sector, where some of you may be aware of this Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission, which was announced in the budget of 2010, which is currently being led by Justice Sri Krishna, that the group itself is 10 members drawn from every related field. Couple of academics, former central bankers, professors of finance, former regulators, uh, government servants, everybody that who sort of should contribute, and a research team of 28 people from every aspect of financial sector, macroeconomics, law, uh, which have all been incorporated and hopefully that's the way we need to write laws. So to conclude, let me sort of uh, say uh, or remind the audience what Milton Friedman writing uh, in 1970 said in a very well uh, sort of uh, quoted uh, passage in words that are immortal, namely, there is one and only one social responsibility of business. <coughs> namely to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase profits so long as, and this is important, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. The rules of the game need to be written by government and they need to be written well. The government must do what it needs to do and the corporate must do what it is good at. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor.
extremely detailed uh, illustration goes, and thank you, and uh, give me some water to kick it off uh, once we are into the panel discussion mode. Uh, Parag, your opening remarks. See, when we talk of corporate social responsibility in a society like ours, we are really talking of a rule of law society which believes broadly in modified laissez-faire system of economics. So, as my good friend Dr. Krishnan said, what you are looking at is, in the words of Friedman, that you are entitled to do what you will so long as you don't run afoul of the law. Over a long period of time, starting from 1930s, it was found that this is too simplistic a view for good governance or for good society. Therefore, you realize that you can't leave certain aspects only to the market interplay or to the free will of the people who are there. So therefore, you had, for instance, labor legislation, even though a worker would be willing to be employed for less, you will put what you call a decent wage or a minimum wage or a living wage. You had, for instance, disclosure requirements. For instance, on tobacco you have to now put in a warning for the last 10 years or so. Now this is also in a sense intrusion in a right of a person to behave as he will. Corporate social responsibility, in my view, is a further extension if if I can use an expression, it is a seepage, as it were, of socialistic principles in a modified laissez-faire system. That is, you realize that then, <coughs> even though there is freedom of action, you have, you have a right to act as you will within the framework of law, <laughs> certain obligations must be imposed on you as economic actors or as business actors so that your focus and endeavor gets focused in a manner which furthers public good. Otherwise, the general belief of laissez-faire economies, that if you mind your own business and follow your profit motive, public interest will automatically follow, is a principle which really may not work out. This brings us to the issue of greed. Now, greed is, in my view, a very, has a very negative moralistic flavor. We are not really talking of greed here, because greed can also mean that I, I covet and I something which is not mine. What we are really looking at is the burning desire of economic and social advancement. Now, if you look at this aspect, that is, every actor in a society, whether, whether whatever is the business organization, is entitled to economic and social advancement. What should be the limits and the parameters within which this freedom is to be given? That is really where corporate social responsibility comes in. Is he free, in other words, to say that I will proceed for my economic and social advancement within the framework so, so long as I don't run afoul of a legal or a provision of law? Is everything else open to me? Or is there a greater realization that there are stakeholders in my action. My action is not my individual action. There are stakeholders in my action. The stakeholders are definitely not limited to the management of a company. They surely include the shareholders. But are the stakeholders even more widely spread? Are they also, let us say, the society or the citizenry? Now the CSR is a movement of expanding the, the set of stakeholders from merely shareholders or merely management to other societal elements also. So some aspects of CSR deal with a stakeholder shift from management, let us say, to shareholders. For instance, the need for an independent director so that the investment of the shareholders are better looked after so that the growth within this limited concept of management as a stakeholder and a shareholder as a stakeholder is better and more evenly spread. But there are other aspects which extend this stakeholder aspect further and include society at large. For instance, shouldn't 
a corporate be directed or be focused towards greater good like food security, like education, like empowerment. And with empowerment in India come the question of, say, reservation. The Supreme Court had an occasion to deal with this growing concept of economic power in the private domain and whether, say, fundamental rights would apply to private economic power. And that came up really in 86 in the famous oleum gas leak case or the Shriram case where the Supreme Court highlighted the issue but left it open. Corporate social responsibility is a movement <laughs> towards that concept because it brings about, it's, a, it's an amalgam really of ethics, of transparency, of accountability and most of all of inclusiveness. Now when I was discussing it with my good friend Mr. Tukral, he rightly pointed out but who decides the parameters of corporate social responsibility? The answer in a democracy like ours is of course the parliament, but subject to the constitutional and legal provisions and of course subject to final adjudication if an issue arises of our judicial system. Therefore, these are the parameters within which in my respectful understanding we should move when we talk of corporate social responsibility and as Dr. Krishnan rightly said, to try and move away from value laden words and expressions which all have their uh, umbras and penumbras of uh, moral content to the bare bone concepts <laughs> that is who are the stakeholders, who are the legitimate stakeholders in what is basically a private enterprise. And there you find that there has been a development and a paradigm shift because it's not merely the management, surely the shareholders, but society at large also. And it's not an easy uh, decision or an easy uh, case of parameter laying because you have to take into account these various aspects, the right of private autonomy in a private enterprise or private activity, in a context of a rule of law society, in a context of a society where the crying need is of inclusiveness of growth. Because having a growth which is not inclusive will not do, will definitely not do over a long period of time. It will destabilize the society. So these are all aspects which have necessarily to be considered while dealing with this aspect of corporate social responsibility. Keeping in mind as in a sense Dr. Krishnan says that ultimately a business entity has also to be given that flexibility to achieve the basic purpose for which it has been set up. Yes, but within the context of this enlarged definition and this enlarged set of what are the legitimate stakeholders in the business activity of business organizations. We, I will end with this very uh, uh, touching saying of Mahatma Gandhi when he said that to poor man God comes in the form of food. Therefore growth has to be inclusive and in my understanding corporate social responsibility is an important step to ensure that growth and the benefits of growth are made <coughs> inclusive and extend to the entirety of society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.